was far too large to rightfully be called a sword. It was larger, thicker, heavier, and cruder than any normal blade. By all accounts, it was no more than a hulking mass of iron. Fuckos, and welcome to another episode of Dumpstat. <laughs> I am your host, villain, master, and thing you probably want to kill by now. I'm Archlich Brill, the horrible monster of this podcast. And of course, with me today is Hi. a kabold. Hello. <laughs> Hello, a cleric. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? I'm looking at kabold, so not too good. Uh, well, that's your loss. <laughs> But welcome, everybody. We are in spooky season. As you notice, this October, we have been running around Curse of Strahd a little bit, as it is the key Halloween module of D&D. And since this is spooky season, frankly, it's been a spooky year, it's been a scary year. Oh, my God, we're not going to make it. But we are just going to be doing a lot of different parts to this Curse of Strahd kind of mini series our first episode with john me and him broke down our criticisms of the module as is and today i am sitting down with a cleric because he has read through many tomes and legacies and seen earlier editions and he's going to help us break down the actual concept of the setting and learn more about ravenloft and how it compares to curse of strahd now as opposed to other editions. Also, top of the ticket, we have a Patreon. Patreon. We need money. We need loot. That's the only way to make the lights run. So if you like this podcast, and if you want to see us keep going, please donate to us on Patreon. And that is Patreon slash Dumpstat Podcast. The goblin made sure I learn it so he doesn't have to scream anymore. (laughs) And more importantly, well, not more importantly, same level of importance. We also have a Ko-Fi. I think I'm saying that right. Is that correct, goblin? Thank you. We have a Ko-Fi, which is a little, what do the kids call it? An app? A fucking uh, a tech tree? I don't know. It's a little thing or site that we're on that you can chuck us a couple of bucks for a donation if you don't want to sign up for every month like Patreon. And that helps us too. So if you have five bucks and you're like, that could go to the dump stack, guys, we'd highly, highly appreciate it. And like all things, when it comes to loot, the goblins get it first. So our editor goblin will be the first to touch the loot from Patreon. It goes to him because he does all the editing and he also does all the artwork and we love him and we want him to be fed. Otherwise he dies and then I have to resurrect him and it's a whole process and it takes time. (laughs) And then you have to talk to Orcus and Orcus is a bitch. I don't want to deal with any of that. So Please just donate, give us some loot so that we can feed our goblin. And then what money doesn't go into feeding the goblin goes right back into the show. It helps us out a lot. And the other thing that I know I've been saying forever now, but we have a campaign that is about to be running, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Yes, that's right. I am DMing a whole party going to Icewind Dell. They will travel through the tundra. And I will DM them and give you hints and tricks all about the module. Honestly, Cleric, at this point, I'm realizing that Icewind Dell and Rhyme of the Frost Maiden is a lot heavier <laughs> module than I thought it would be. <laughs> it is a lot of heavy lifting on the DM's part. Most modules are pick up and play. This one feels a little bit more like you need to have some real DMing muscles. So that's been a really fun challenge for me. And I think it will also be a great little experience for our listeners so that you guys can learn how to play. It's all that fun. So, a cleric. Mm-hmm. It's Christmas time. Wait a minute. It's Halloween no, time. It is the opposite of Christmas time. <laughs> We're not going to make it to Christmas. Well, <laughs> <laughs> We're just not. So, John and I originally did an episode about Curse of Strahd that had a lot of reactions to it where we criticized the module. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that episode, I said, hey, I'm going to get other people's opinion on Ravenloft, on Curse of Strahd, about the whole aesthetic of gothic horror and that kind of side of D&D because I realized speaking to John, it's just the two of us and I want more people to be involved with the conversation. So you 
are much older than a kobold should be. <laughs> and frankly, you've played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and you have connections to Ravenloft. Is that correct? So, OK. Yeah. A little point of clarification. Kobolds can live forever. They just don't because they get killed. <laughs> And <laughs> that's terrifying. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a decent amount of experience with the, the classic I six Ravenloft module that first introduced. This is like a this is a advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition module. That's how far back this goes. Right. And then I have some experience with the Ravenloft in the 3.5 era. Right. I have not actually ever read through Curse of Strahd. OK, I tend to use modules more as like leaping off points than as like running modules. So for the most part, I have passing at best knowledge of 5e modules. If you're listening to this right now and you don't know what Curse of Strahd is, please listen to our first part. We break it down pretty well over there. We're just going to dive into it now. So you have kind of a different, I guess, perspective than a lot of D&D players right now. Most D&D players have come out of the Matt Mercer critical role boom from 5e. Mm-hmm. And you come from a earlier lineage. So <laughs> I'm really interested to see how you think Ravenloft is and how I can tell you it compares to Curse of Strahd now. Okay. So let's start with Ravenloft. What can you tell me about the original module and kind of its legacy in Dungeons and Dragons? Okay. I think one of the biggest shifts in the D&D paradigm that has happened since its inception to the modern incarnation of D&D is the concept of player mortality. So if you're looking at old D&D, it is brutally unforgiving and you're kind of expecting players and entire parties to die. There are DMs who would get popular for how much and how frequently they did TPKs where they killed off the entire party right. and everyone had to start new characters. That the, the concept of a TPK in 5e is so foreign from where we are now with our emphasis on building up role playing and characters to be awesome heroes. And I think that is an endlessly fascinating topic that I'd love to talk about more. But Ravenloft as a concept, I think, is heavily couched in that earlier mindset in a kind of not in the same like jerk way as Tomb of Horrors is, but there is a sort of sense of player mortality lurks around every corner. Right. So I think in an older edition, the idea that you could be out wandering on at night, get jumped by 20 wargs and torn to shreds fits a lot better than it does in 5e, where you've made this character, you've made a backstory for them, you know where you want this character to go five levels from now, then you go walk out into the woods and you're torn to shreds. Right. Now, in 5th edition, it feels more like the players are heroes. Right. In earlier editions, it feels like you're becoming heroes and that you're just a guy. (laughs) You're You're just Jerry from the mill. Right. And you picked up a sword and you head to the wrong part of town. Right. A 5e party is the, I don't call them the cast of a story or a novel, but there is much more of a sense for you guys are special even at level one. This is the story of how, why you're special. Right. Old D&D, it was perfectly reasonable to kill a party member mid-session. That right. player goes into the other room for like maybe 20 minutes at most to roll up another character and you place them in the next dungeon, you know, like a prison cell that they go and rescue that person and they keep playing. That was the mindset to an extent for how old D&D went. You had characters and maybe legends would form around the character that survived all those gnarly dungeons. But at the time that you're creating these characters, you're not necessarily going to be like, yes, this character is going to do this thing 10 levels from now. Here's my story arc for this character. As a matter of fact, You might be thinking of many, many characters that you might want to play more to handle a dungeon than to actually just be that character. So if you have a difficult dungeon, you might be like, ah, maybe we need a wizard. Right, right. And it even used to be a requirement when you leveled up in some earlier editions. When you leveled up, you were gone to a way to a school for a couple in-game weeks or months. So you would have your character. He just had a level up. So you'd send him away to school or training or whatever you want to call it. And you play a different character during that time with the rest of the party. So there was, there, was, there was much more revolving door. Yeah, here's my cast of characters that I play. Right. OK, so that's kind of the root or the, I the think soil. The, the, the soil of where Curse of Strahd hits in a different way than classic Ravenloft. So okay. classic Ravenloft is one 
not designed for level one characters. You were expecting a party of six to eight, five to seventh level, I believe is how it's described in the book. Oh, wow. OK. So you were you were looking for a large party of moderately powerful characters. These are people who are established characters who have been around the block a couple of times and are ready for a challenge. I know that Curse of Strahd goes one to ten. Right. That's that's pretty high level for a party back in the day. Yeah. No, those, those are people who have been around for a while. I know Curse of Strahd, you're going one to ten. So you're 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 this could be a brand new character that you dropped into Ravenloft. That's true. That's a rough time. I'm going to I'm going to be straight <laughs> up. The, if I was going to introduce someone to D&D, the last thing I would do is introduce them to D&D via Ravenloft. OK, you and I agree on that for sure. A hundred percent. It is. It is. No, it, it really is. When you look at the monster manual or anything in D&D, you see this wide range of genres and ideas and concepts and you can go anywhere. You can do almost anything. 5E is choices abounding. Mm-hmm. And it's weird that people go, you know what? I want to eat candy corn year round. That <laughs> is a little rough, especially considering the fact that the candy corn has razor blades in it. And I'm sitting there going like, hey, man, we got, you know, the reference. We, we, we have we have Reese's peanut butter cups. We have, <laughs> you know, you can eat a filet mignon. Like, you know, there's, a, <laughs> there's a way to maybe make it different. So when it comes to a party going into Curse of Strahd as compared to older Ravenloft. Yeah, no, a, a lot of new DMs and a lot of new players are introduced to Dungeons and Dragons in 5e through Curse of Strahd, which I can imagine flavors everything oh it would have to everything it would have to give you an entirely different perspective on what D is right like you you envision someone who starts off in the minds of fandle beer and you compare that to someone who starts off in curse of straw right that's your first experience with role playing as a concept entirely different outtakes of what you think D is about I mean, it's almost like you're having your players start off on a very, very weird island, <laughs> like a weird island. And that's what Barovia is. That's in a sense. what Barovia is. Yes. So Barovia is classically in, in your I-6 module before they've got their own campaign setting. It's a isolated section of whatever country they're in. It's not right. It's a small domain that really consists of a castle and the village beneath it. I mean, there's the right. woods around it. That, that, that's your that's your adventure setting for the classic Ravenloft. Right. It's expanding quite a bit in fifth edition. Well, yeah. And, and they expanded. They, they made a whole campaign setting for it later on. But I'm, ta- I'm, I'm just we're talking the first right. First appearance of Strahd. OG castle village. OG. This is this is. The Tracy and Laura Hickman I-6 adventure module. What I was getting at with mm-hmm. the actual island idea, though, is the idea that you start your players off and, like we said, this castle with a village, this mm-hmm. island in Curse of Strahd. And then what if they get past Barovia and you expand Dungeons and Dragons? And this is the first time they've ever played. They've only played through Curse of Strahd and they meet an NPC who isn't insane, mean <laughs> or trying to kill them or or sad. Like mm-hmm. they they meet like a nice baker who gives them a hug. They're going to go, what is going on? They won't know how to handle it. And right. it's kind of like it's it's kind of like abuse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like, I I don't know. It it feels to me kind of like when you have just people who come from a different culture entirely from your own and they show up and you give them, you know, maybe you take your shoes off when you walk inside and they're just like, really? Where I come from, we put our dirty boots on the counter. And you're like, well, (laughs) not here, bud. That's kind of what it feels like with Curse of Strahd starting players. Well, and and that's very true because early, early level characters and early players are still figuring out how D&D works. You don't learn D&D by reading the rule books. You learn D&D by playing it. So your early experience with D&D is what you think D&D is for several years until you've experienced enough different styles up to realize that it's this multi-limbed amalgamation of everything fantastical from right. space pirates to Ravenloft. Those, those are about, those are pretty far into the spectrum. So if, if your first experience is Ravenloft, then you're going to think the entire world is like Ravenloft. You're going to think D&D is like Ravenloft. And that's really just not true. Yeah. I mean, it's a gothic horror setting, and that is a very specific genre. It's a very specific genre. It really is. The Ravenloft module is designed to be, here's our gothic horror adventure 
isn't this awful? Let's not stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious because in fifth edition, it's, hey, here's our gothic horror adventure. Don't you want to stay? Right. Aren't you happy? It becomes it becomes your campaign setting. And, and, <laughs> and asterisk on what I'm saying, there is a Ravenloft campaign setting in multiple editions of D&D. People liked Ravenloft enough. They wanted to be there more. So they, well, gothic horror is a cool aesthetic to visit. It really is. It really is. I just think that staying in a year round as your first campaign. I would Holy not. I would not shit. recommend that. I would not recommend. Yeah. That. So you have classic Ravenloft, which you have already started to mention. Mm-hmm. And when we refer to Ravenloft, we're talking about the OG module. And when we're referring to Curse of Strahd, we will say Curse of Strahd. That works. So try to keep those as separate in your minds as possible, because <laughs> while they do share similarities and people might get a little mixed up, Ravenloft, we're talking about OG, first module, advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and we're talking about Curse of Strahd, we're saying 5th edition, ain't that weird. So try to separate as best as you can in your minds. I just realized as you and I were going back and forth, I was like, is he talking about this or that? Oh, it's going to get real confusing. We're going to try to keep it, because it's all named the same, we're trying to separate it as best we can. So, OG Ravenloft. Mm-hmm. It's gothic horror with Strahd as a Dracula clone running this tiny domain. Yeah. Right? Is that the basic premise? That's the basic premise. That's the basic premise of Curse of Strahd. But as you and I have spoken, the differences from the roots of basically Barovia and, and Curse of Strahd, where it all started in Ravenloft in that first module, it's changed quite a bit from first, like advanced D&D, all the way to fifth edition. Mm-hmm. So... What are some of those weird changes or strange inconsistencies that have evolved over the multi editions that have come forward? So the best way I could describe this is I don't call it a translation error, but I want to think about I want to align it with like the idea that in over time ideas more uh, adapting something you're not going to get the the original intent the same way. Does that make sense? Sure. The first thing that everyone talks about with Ravenloft and I think Curse of Shot as well is the whole the tarot card reading to set up where places and monsters are. Sure, that's in Curse of Strahd and that's the in the original module. Yep. Now, that fits much better into an older module because the idea of running the same adventure module multiple times was much more understood back then. It wasn't the idea of, oh, we beat this, now we'll beat this, now we'll beat this. It was all right, let's throw this party against this module, see how they do. You might play a module, get beaten like 25% of the way through it, make a different party, go do something else. And maybe you'd be like, okay, these guys are leveled up again. Let's throw them at Curse of Strahd and see how it works. Or throw them at Ravenloft, huh. rather. Right, right, right. It's more of just for, hey, you've gotten to the higher levels. Now let's see what you can do in this horrific setting. Right. Not in the sense of, what was the thing John said in the last episode? You were taking a dump out in the woods and the mist came. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it feels more like heroes who are... More legends Mm -hmm. have decided to throw themselves into Ravenloft. So that's a good first distinction between the two. And I'm going to actually... So, okay, two two thoughts I have on that. So one, classic Ravenloft, you choose to go into Barovia. It's kind of chosen for you because classic modules are like that. It's, hey, here's a letter telling you to come here to save this, to save Irina and... We'll pay you lots of money. And that's enough that you're like, yeah, we'll go into this creepy forest. Right. That, that's that's okay. kind of the presumption that's made, because if you don't do that, then the DM has to come up with something else. And because we're playing a module, the assumption is you do do that because then you can play the module. Right. But still thematically as a story, your characters are making a choice. Right. And, that, and it does resonate as a very different thing from you've been captured versus you are noble heroes going into Baroque. Now, I will say, I will say that the myth as a trapping force is in classic Ravenloft, the campaign setting. It is like one of the most okay. famous things Ravenloft does is grab parties from other campaign worlds and keep them in Ravenloft for a little while. It's, the, it's like okay. the, the built in universe excuse for your normal campaign to suddenly be Ravenloft for a little while is that the mist will come out and grab yeah, you. Yeah, the, the, the writers need a crutch. Exactly. It's, it is, yeah, it is a writer's crutch for why there's this horrible place right here. Right. If you're if you're in a fantastical world of like Greek gods, like in the earlier modules and Mm -hmm. you're fighting off like 
a classical like Gorgon Medusa type. Mm-hmm. And then in, in between sessions, you're just like, hey, DM, could we go to Ravenloft? <laughs> <laughs> you take your Spartans and you march over to Ravenloft exactly. through the mist. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a writer's crush. But so to, to pull back to the tarot cards for a bit. So a big element of gothic horror and just horror in general is that you don't really know what to expect. Sure. So having a element of randomness in the tarot card reading changes how your adventure runs so that when you run that adventure multiple times, you can't meta know where Strahd's going to be, where the talisman that blasts Strahd with sunlight is going to be and just be run to those things. Sure. So that serves a much more important purpose for a module that the same player will encounter multiple times. Okay. I don't feel like most people are going to want to play Curse of Strahd so many times that they're going to memorize where everything is. Well, okay. So here's the one thing that I have noticed. Okay. There are a lot of Curse of Strahd parties, at least in 5e. Mm -hmm. The tarot cards concept as a game mechanic is something that is widely talked about. Uh, especially amongst DMs. Oh, I think it's an excellent one. It, it adds flavor. It adds prophecy so that you 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 built into your story now a connection from where we were at the beginning of the prologue to events as they play out. And that's excellent. Sure. That's excellent. And and moreover, there are, frankly, multiple parties that go to Barovia. I've heard of many campaigns going back and back and back with level one characters in 5e. And players begin to learn what each tarot card does in the meta. Okay. So I can fathom. So, I mean, that is true. Yeah, I can fathom players going, oh, we got that. Interesting. So just, just as a little aside, I, for one, would never really call myself a fan of Barovia or Ravenloft to the point where I know all the tarot cards as a mm-hmm. player. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> um, they are out there, especially with uh, Curse of Strahd being such a phenomenon to the point where, I mean, the Curse of Strahd revamp is coming out, I believe, October 20th mm-hmm. of this, 22nd coming of out real this soon. year. If not yeah. already, by the time this gets... <laughs> Probably not. Maybe falls. it is. The, the goblin will yell at us either way. Uh, but w- what I'm getting at is it's in that set, though, you get a, you get tarot cards. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's because not only is it part of the legacy of the actual module, but on top of that, people like it. People oh, yeah. know it's, it's, it's real thematic. Cards. It's real thematic. Uh, I'm curious sure. about this. Does, does the modern tarot cards include anything with the suit of the cards? Not really, no. Okay. So... When you play the classic module, one of the tarot cards you're reading is literally just interested in the suit of the card because you're playing with playing cards. They're not expecting you to have actual tarot cards. But oh, no. In in Curse of Strahd, they're actual like tarot cards, not a card cards. And yeah, so they're assuming you're going to just be using a deck of playing cards. Yeah, yeah. No, in, in Curse of Strahd 5e, you can, I believe, just cut them out and mm-hmm. play with them. So the the suit card is literally going to just be a positive or negative stat modifier to all your players' rolls. Oh, that's awesome. It can range from, hey, everything you roll is going to have a plus one for the rest of this adventure to everything you roll is going to have a negative one. Holy shit. It's just, it's just here's a card. Your life is easier or harder. I love that. And you have thematic, and there's like nice little thematic phrases going with it, being like, oh, the black spade, that is the power of darkness welling up against you. It's a blanket modifier that is literally a random chance, but it reinforces the concept of, hey, you're going to take multiple cracks at this more than likely. Okay. Today's a good day. Today's a bad day. Let's see how you do. Today's a bad day. Today. <laughs> You got the ace of spades. It's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I should also mention. Okay. I'm going to guess this isn't in 5e. The DM is instructed to do this secretly and not tell the players unless they go to meet Madam Eva. So I believe I, I've been in a couple of different campaigns. Okay. I have been in a campaign where the DM decided to, yeah, you go to the actual Vistani or the, the Madam or whomever is the card dealer, and you actually see what you get. And I've also had the actual DM just not tell us entirely. Okay. But I've had multiple DMs who have overwhelmingly used 
either or. So I've seen the tarot cards. I've not seen the tarot cards. In the module, it's kind of implied that I think the players eventually do see them, Mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily think that's a hard and fast rule for anything. So the way it works in I6, just to just follow up, is that you you do them in secret, and then if the players go and get the tarot reading from Madam Eva, you do a new one, and that becomes the setup because they know it. Okay. That's interesting. That's very odd. I love the concept of the tarot cards, though. It is, it is, I think, one of the reasons why Curse of Strahd hits home in a way that, let's say, Horde of the Dragon Queen does not. Sure. Uh, at least thematically. It really yeah. plays into what the actual setting is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you have to go into Ravenloft wanting to experience some gothic horror. Sure. You should never have a party that doesn't want gothic horror go into Ravenloft. I'm going to just I'm just going to say that. Don't don't make your players <laughs> play in gothic horror. OK, so moving a little bit away from the tarot cards, unless yeah. you have another thing about no, that. That's 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 decent. OK, in that case, what are other comparisons that we can make between the original module and the new Curse of Strahd 5e module? New in the air quotes is four years old now. Does Strahd have one plan or does Strahd's plan change based on the tarot card? My dude has a plan <laughs> <laughs> in Curse of Strahd and... So there are tarot cards that can affect where Strahd is, Mm -hmm, I believe, mm -hmm. but they do not act and where uh, the items to defeat him are Mm -hmm. in the world. And Mm -hmm. I think of how aggressive he might be and what allies you can get along the way. However, I do not believe his plan ever really evolves from, I want to get married. I really don't think it really evolves from there. He wants Irina, period. Okay. Through charm. That is one of four possible Strahd goals in the classic Ravenloft. What the fuck? Okay, (laughs) tell me what the other four are. Okay. Um, Actually, I'm going to go through all four because I think there's a a key distinction between the Irina plot, too, that I want to get through. But so... I love it. Tell me. First off, the most boring one. Straw wants to make a magic spear of darkness, make it always nighttime so that he can do whatever he wants and never have to worry about the sun. That's you know the most what? bland generic one. It's, it's boring, it's generic, but fuck, I would take it. <laughs> <laughs> Plot two, Straw wants to destroy the sun sword. Oh. So in the classic Ravenloft, the sun sword is in pieces. I don't know if that's the case in Curse of Strahd. Or if they, it's just I do not believe fine. so. Okay. I do so not in classic it. Ravenloft, a random party member has been unknowingly using half the sun sword on their weapon. Oh. So if they can find the hilt of the sun sword, then they can reform the sun sword and fight Strahd. Okay. Strahd wanted them to come here because he wants the sun sword to be destroyed. And so the fact that half of it is somewhere else, not in Barovia, freaks him out. Right. And to be frank, that plotline of the sword is in Curse of Strahd. Okay. I do not believe it's in pieces, but you can get it. Okay. Wait, wait, if it is in pieces, please, Goblin, scream at me. But if not, we're good. <laughs> well, it'd be, it'd be two pieces. It's the blade and the hilt. Okay. So the hilt is somewhere in Barovia. The blade has been we're unknowingly not used as a... <laughs> okay. I just realized how I, I, I'm i completely blanking on this answer, and I'm worried that people are just <laughs> well, but that's screaming like, at their Spotify. I don't hear people talking about the Sun Sword much in Curse of Strahd. Well, there is a sword. There is I, a sword. I, I know it exists, it. but it, it's, it's all about relevance. Like, this would be your main plot point is he's trying to get this sword. He doesn't okay. care about Irina really. He wants the sword to be destroyed. So, okay. number three is a little interesting. Strahd wants to get out of Barovia. Hell so, yes, that was an option. Me and John suggested back in episode one. Can we <laughs> dig it? Oh, so that is his, so much better. His plan for doing this. Holy shit. Grab one of you, one of your players alone, charm them, polymorph them into a vampire, polymorph himself into them, join the party and say, hey, guys, I found a way out. Dude, that is cartoony, goofy, stupid, and I fucking love every second of it. (laughs) That is so much better. I'm sorry. Just the idea of him going swap, charm, swap, swap. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys! (laughs) I'm Gorg, the orc. Mm Want to get out of here? 
<laughs> you know, that is a fantastic plot line. I love that more. Okay. And I imagine the next one is Irina. Yeah, correct? he wants Irina. Now, interestingly, his plan to do this is different from what you've described to me in Curse of Strive. Uh-huh. His plan to do this is a little bit cartoony, I'm not going to lie. His plan is, I'm going to get these people to come here to Barovia, charm them all, so you charm the party, make them attack her, then I'll swoop in and save her so she'll fall in love with me. Okay. First of all, the Green Goblin had a same plot line. Okay. <laughs> this predates the Green Goblin. Well, actually, I don't know if this predates the Green Goblin comic. I can almost guarantee you it doesn't. Don't start with me. <laughs> but <laughs> now there is an important phrase here at the end. This 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 last sentence of that plot line, I think, is key. Right. He wants Irina to love him willingly rather than by force. Huh. Interesting. I found that I'm, very interesting. I find so okay. Old school Strahd. Count Chocula all the way. We can't deny it. Cartoony mm-hmm. as fuck. It's mm-hmm. okay. But for s- somewhere in his DNA, he went from cartoony Dracula clone to creepy fuck boy. And, and it's this timeline that I really need to focus in on. I prefer him trying to gain the love of Irina willingly. I think that is a much better plot line for him. And he's smart enough to know that charming people isn't true love mm-hmm. or anything meaningful. It, it's, if anything, it's it's disgusting. It's tragic. It's not a good way of handling things. I, Agreed. for one, really enjoy this version of Strahd, despite the fact that, yes, he's a little bit mustache twirly. So it is a little mustache twirly, but I think this is a, a a concept from the Ravenloft campaign setting overall. So in the Ravenloft campaign setting, you've got your dark lords and then your dark powers. Right. So your dark lords are people like Strahd, who are in charge of sections of Ravenloft and kind of have these insane magic powers of, oh my gosh, how can we ever stop this guy? He rules the world. But they themselves are kind of imprisoned in Ravenloft by the dark powers. And the dark powers are incredibly vague and nebulous and are really just kind of messing with the dark lords along with everyone else in Ravenloft. So all the dark lords have all this power, but they can never really get what they want. So the the dark powers in Strahd's case, Strahd wants to be with Titiana. So the dark power is like, oh, we'll keep reincarnating a version of her that you see. And like, oh, there's my long lost love that I can never reclaim. And you can keep trying. You can have all these plans for how you're going to finally be with her after your centuries of undeath. But it'll never quite work out. And it'll always kind of be your fault so that you think that next time you can do it better. No, it, it's it's a very similar plot point in Curse of Strahd. Clearly, Chris Perkins and the gang decided mm-hmm. to go back into the OG module for work. Oh, definitely. However, I still think that, yeah, no, a lot of this OG Dracula clone shit is probably a better way to go about it. And with the dark powers, I know they kind of changed in 5e to be a lot more nebulous and strange, mm-hmm. more of dark energy or entities we're unaware of but in the old school it sounds way more like it, it does sound like a council board room with seven dudes who are going yeah <laughs> like well it's- so it's that and not that so like there's the dark lords are a a a, le- a set of people who are going to mess with each other you got it's basically your your rogues gallery greatest hits of D villains I could go into the concept of Ravenloft as D&D purgatory, but we're not going to, we don't have time for that. <laughs> and then there's the dark powers that are arguably the mists or arguably something else that just do their thing and we don't really know what they're about. Okay. So that is still there in older editions. Okay. But the, the idea that there is also a, a set of peers for someone like Strahd who are going to mess with him like he messes with them is, I think, also important. But Well, is, yeah, in Curse of Strahd, he kind of stands alone in his own kind of class. It seems like a very lone villain. It right. doesn't sound like anyone's competing with him all that necessarily in a close domain to his. Right. It feels very separate. He's alone. He's stuck in his little purgatory box. 
and no one can reach him. He's not messing with someone other than the people who live there, and no one's really messing with him, except maybe the adventurers who go there. There isn't really a pull and pull between him and Asmodeus or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. What else do we have in the way of comparison? Okay, I will say that the classic Ravenloft module is mostly a dungeon crawl. Okay, that's very, very different. So there's there's the village that you go to originally, and there's there's some description of things that are going on in the village, but it's 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 clearly the preamble to the dungeon. It's it's clearly not meant to be okay, we have a couple sessions of you wandering around this village and dealing with these villagers. The the Barovians are uh, your your classic gothic horror peasant where they're just <laughs> they're they're hiding in their houses. They don't like outsiders, mobs and pitchforks when you bring out the magic. It's 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 not going to be something that players are really going to get attached to, I don't think. But hopefully they can be sympathetic towards. There are still classic peasants in Curse of Strahd. However, there is more of a lean towards everyone's sad or everyone's insane or everyone has a backstory of them being corrupted. Rarely do you just meet a peasant. And when you do meet a peasant, he's usually also a werewolf or something. <laughs> so... I don't think that the classic mob mentality is gone necessarily, but I don't know. I don't think you're going to be chased around like Frankenstein's monster mm -hmm. as much as probably earlier editions. It's more of you blow into town and they all kind of look out and they're like, everything sucks here. Go, leave, leave now. And you're like, why? And then <laughs> they go look behind you and you whirl around and it's like, a ghost of a werewolf holding a dead child. And you're like, what the fuck? And it's like, <laughs> yes, his name, his name is Paler and he's the greatest of all of us. He will eat you. And they all start screaming and saying, <laughs> which, you know, I mean, that undercurrent is still there. It's, yeah. It's, it's nice for the first town. Yeah. So that's, that's the other thing too. So yeah, you got, you got one town in your OG Ravenloft. It's not several villages of this. Right. It, it's more, it's, more more you get that in one town and then you go to the next town and it's like oh this place is a little bit nicer and then someone goes get out and you're like oh no not this again what and they're like baba lasagna lives over the hill and they're like baba lasagna and then this horrible slavic witch who has the head of lasagna flies in cackling throwing i don't know a pumpkin bombs <laughs> green goblin god damn you we got a hardcore green goblin theme today <laughs> all right so <laughs> <laughs> the Green Goblin. <laughs> Norman Osborn, what's up with his hair? Oh, God. No, yeah, that's a long story. Okay, so you have the classic villagers who are more, we don't take too kindly to outsiders. Mm -hmm. They are scared of monsters because there seems to be a lot of them crawling around. It's a much more condensed setting. You're not going to get attached to the villagers, but at the same time, you're not going to kick over a rock and find out one of them's an angel. Right. Okay. The only NPC that will probably stay with the party for any length of time is Irina herself. Right. She's, Which she's, is kind of cool. Yeah. No one in town is like, no one in town wants to protect her from a vampire anymore. Her dad's dead. Her half of is like, hey, I need some help. And no one in town wants to mess with the vampire. So they're like, yeah, good luck with that. Right. She's like, hey, I've got this problem. Can I hang with you guys for a bit? But they make a point of saying that she will fight with them and do other things. She's not a damsel in distress. Right. Which is cool because that's at least continued into the current module. Good. Good. I'm glad that's still there. That'd be a, that'd be an unfortunate backslide. Oh, yeah. Well. If anything, I feel like they've given her more to do or more agency, which is nice. That's also good. There's still an undercurrent of Strahd wanting to charm her, which isn't great. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at least at least she's able to have agency and try to fight back. OK, so what else do we have? OK, Strahd is a fan of hit and run tactics to an almost goofy degree. <laughs> How do you mean? Unless they're in the castle, he's probably going to attack them for about five rounds and then flee into the night cackling. OK, so that is remained and left. OK, kind of. I think this is where cartoon villain meets omnipresent god of a demi Right. Right. 
because Curse of Strahd OG, like you said, is this Dracula clone who if someone enters his realm, of course he's going to attack. Like that kind of makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. But the issue is he, like you said, it's kind of cartoony. He comes in bam, and starts fucking people up and then he's like, oh no, my robes and he disappears, right? That's you, You'll be coming in with wolves and bats and all that classic vampire minion stuff. And then cool. after a little while, he'll be like, all right, we'll see you later. And then he'll just turn into gas and fly away. <laughs> Which is cartoony, but I like that in a way because currently I've been in a couple of Curse of Strahd campaigns and either A, Strahd does kind of do something similar where he'll show up to the party and attack them a little bit early on. Mm-hmm. And that's more just to crush them. But that's kind of towards the DM's kind of homebrewiness of the story. And rules is written, Strahd shows up to mock them, like as a <laughs> cool, badass anime villain who's like the final boss coming up to the young new hero. It's like, hmm. So you think you're going to defeat me? Mm -hmm. I'll see you for dinner later. No, and he leaves. Um, But nothing, nothing like cartoon hammer. I'm going to get them while they're sleeping. It's way more trying to be suave and charismatic and powerful and intelligent and the god of a realm. Not so much. I'm here to fuck you up. Oh God, I'm getting hurt. Goodbye. Like it's it's not well, that way. So you are supposed to play Strahd smart. He isn't supposed to be an idiot. Okay. He should know when he's using spells. He should know when he's losing a fight. But it is a layer of I don't want to say cartooniness because it's not cartoony, but it is it is a your desire here is to build up a rivalry with Strahd without completely draining the party's resources. That's that's okay. your, that's your narrative function here. So he'll show up with some wolves. You can say he's taking the measure of his enemies, but that doesn't really match because he kind of just does whatever he does anyway. <laughs> that's true. It does. It just does feel cartoony. I can see why that evolved to people liking Strahd because he is a personal villain that shows up and bothers the party mm-hmm. in both kind of modules, but. In one, it sounds more like he's trying to tactfully take out the party. And the other one, he's toying with his dinner. Exactly. Blah, blah, blah. No, it is very much the latter in the original. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So give me one more comparison if you got one. Okay. So I assume they keep the classic empty carriage to take you into the castle. Of course. Good, good. That's a classic. Does the the drawbridge contain a 5% chance for instant death? I do not believe so. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of adventure this is. Like it, it's it's a here's our creaky old drawbridge to get into the castle. Any player that crosses it except Strahd has to roll a percentile dice five or lower. They fall through unless they make a deck save. And I now can understand why Curse of Strahd is written in the way that it's written, just because if it's trying to keep in that old school DNA, then it's going to be a much more deadly module. Right. The problem is it's asking for new players and it's easily picked up by new DMs. Right. So suddenly you have a lot of people who are green walking into essentially a very flavored, very different and very deadly module. Exactly. The cat, the Ravenloft module is designed to be here is a challenging vampire with his haunted castle. It's got all sorts of nasty undead. It's got teleport traps that'll separate the party up so that they're isolated and can be picked off by Strahd. It is designed to be deadly. The problem is 5e dungeons don't want to be deadly in that way because what's the classic rule of D&D? Don't split the party. Right. This dungeon is designed to split the party. There, there are multiple plots where Strahd's best goal is to get one of the players alone so that he can get what he wants from them without everyone else so messing with him. So he can swap into him. So he can swap into him, so he can steal his sword piece. It's, it's, <laughs> it, is, it is designed to be a disorienting, split-the-party kind of dungeon. I think Strahd's a decent villain for a D&D module. Huh? I think he's a good villain. He's got motivations that directly impact the party and are interesting enough that when your player learns how to look, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm afraid, Kabold, that today you've made the gravest mistake of crossing paths with me with your stupid, horrible, pathetic opinion. I will show you the true power of a lich and destroy you from all time and space! 
minion. <gasps> now witness me within my final form as I destroy this podcast in five minutes. Destructo disc. Cabal's flare. Nine hell zone grenade. No need. Oh. I'm afraid this isn't even my final form there, Kabolderat. <gasps> Fool! You can never defeat me! I am the strongest, most powerful thing in all the multiverse! Finger of death be! Hey, what the hell's going on up here? Oh. Ah! Ah! My skin! Ah, it's burning my skin! Ah. I don't understand! The finger of death beam should have killed that kobold immediately! He better be holding something back! How's he still standing? Can it be? The special kobold cannon! No! So, what are your final thoughts on Curse of Strahd and Ravenloft? But, wait, 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 wait. But you were just... I just flactory. It's fine. Fine. Uh, Tell me what your final thoughts are on the two modules. Uh, okay. So I think that the Ravenloft concept is a good concept for a module. It gives you a chance to dip your toes into the gothic horror, the fear of the unknown and the uncanny that is present in D&D, but really kind of on the wayside. You run into like horrible monsters, but you fight them and you beat them because you're a hero. Sure. With, with the Ravenloft setting, you're going to run into more of your classic monsters. So you're not going to run into like an Ochija or something weird like that. But the sure. things that you fight, you're going to need to prepare for how to beat them because on your own, you're not going to be able to do it. So I like the concept that the concepts that come with that. I think you have to handle it carefully. You can't. You, it, it, it's, it's very easy, particularly in our modern world of The Witcher and Game of Thrones to have just dark fantasy where everything sucks and no one's happy. Right. That's a, a danger that you can run into very easily with Ravenloft, I think. But I think it weakens the aesthetic and it weakens the the promise, if you will, of a Ravenloft adventure. Right. And there is a way to do it. There's a way to involve gothic horror. But I think our criticisms of what Curse of Strahd or Strahd the character used to be on top of what a DM can do to have those classic elements involved are a lot better than kind of what we have with Curse of Strahd and just the bare bones. Why are you going here at level one? <laughs> and why is Strahd acting like a fuck boy? And can we have some loot, please, sir? Like there are <laughs> criticisms to the current edition and to the current Ravenloft. It is a loot low module. You've got a couple magic items hidden away, and that is it. Right. Because you're supposed to be already equipped. Sure. And I think, at least for the modern edition of this module, that we need to address these concerns, because Wizards of the Coast is even addressing these concerns in their new revamped edition, which, by the way, if you fuckos don't think we are going to re review the shit out of, <laughs> you are highly mistaken so we are going to be doing something with that but on top of this i think we need to look inward as dms and see what we can do at least with the classic elements from the original ravenloft setting and how to add some of that charm back into curse of strahd because a lot of things that you've mentioned at least in comparisons I've really, really... Yeah, there, there's a lot of good stuff in the concept. There's a lot of good stuff in the setting. 
Don't send people there who don't want to be there. Don't force your players to play Gothic horror. It will be. That's true. It, it, it is. It is not a happy time. You don't read Frankenstein expecting to enjoy yourself. You will enjoy yourself, but it won't be the same kind of thing as reading. I don't know. Lord of the Rings. It's they're different. You, you want to go to them for something different. Well, it's also a, a weird evolution of the genre, though, because at least classic Ravenloft in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons feels a lot more like Gothic horror than Curse of Strahd which feels like it adds a lot more like 80s, 90s horror elements to it. Like the mm-hmm. entire party getting just crushed and there being essentially a house of death. And that house is full of essentially saw D&D version torture chamber type shit. Yeah, that's not that's not in the classic module. <laughs> yeah, there, it's a very modern spin on a classic module. But if you want to keep it gothic horror... Gothic horror is kind of cheesy, like a little bit. Yes. And (laughs) maybe not a little, maybe a lot. Yes. I'm 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 going to go ahead and say yes. Gothic horror is cheesy. (laughs) Yeah. It's good. It's good. And you can do a lot of good things with it. I would not pretend for a moment that Jekyll and Hyde is not a well-constructed story. Yeah. It's also about a man who turns into another man. (laughs) Yes. It's a little bit goofy. I do think, though, that when it comes to where the module is walked, it seems as though that Curse of Strahd almost feels like it's trying too hard in the sense of horror. It's trying to make its bones in a, ooh, you're going to die. And not only are you going to die, but it's going to be quick. And there's going to be this mastermind and he's going to kill you. And isn't that awesome? And the kind of original take of it from the first module feels way more like, yo, who wants to fight Dracula? And everyone's like, I do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that is there that's a very different feel to compare the two i for one think that a lot of those og elements especially the different motivations for strad should be ripped from that and put back in because having just the bare bones i want to go off when is kind of goofy to me i mean it's still there it's still in his journal all the 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 lore hasn't changed that much but it's the emphasis of the character and i think to an extent, this is partially because there's been like novels and stuff since then that have built that up as strong oh, yeah. character. So right. this is his first appearance where he was a more generic character. Yeah, he was more of a he was a Dracula clone. Yeah. But you are right that in between then and now there has been books and modules and editions. So it solidified Strahd in a very different direction, which makes him less of a Dracula clone and more of his own character. But at the same time, there are elements of his new solidified character that, frankly, are not only problematic, but are kind of boring, in my opinion. So in that case, with everything we have going on so far, what do you suggest for new DMs who want to take a trip to Ravenloft? Uh, don't. <laughs> no, um, I think Ravenloft is maybe one of my favorite campaign settings. Really? Done right, it can get you a very different experience with D&D. If you are new to role playing and want to play horror, I would not play Ravenloft. I would play Vampire or I would play Call of Cthulhu. Okay. Now, I don't know that I recommend those for people who are new to RPGs either. But I think you should go to Ravenloft when you have an established foot in D&D and you want to see a more horrific take on it. A hundred percent. And not only that, it allows for maybe play, play with horror. Exactly. We have monsters in the monster manual that are horrific and you can throw one or two of those in an early session and see how your players react to. Because there's a lot of players that say, I want to go to Ravenloft. They show up. And then they go, get me out of here. Like there's not, (laughs) and there's no enjoyment out of that. So there has to be that weird line that you walk to make sure that everything. So with that, a cleric, I appreciate you coming in here. There's a final thing. The OG module for Ravenloft. How many flumps out of 10 do you give it? Mm, I'll give it eight flumps out of 10. Eight flumps out of 10. See, Curse of Strahd, I only gave three flumps out of 10. So clearly there is a very different between these two modules, a very different flavor. But eight out of ten, that's a very good rating. I think I think it is a good classic module. Okay. When you compare it to things like the Lost City or or your your older stuff, like your keep on the borderlands, your 
you're in search of the unknown, that level of module, which is really the era of modules it's coming from. Sure. It's got a lot more flavor and character to it. Okay. I can certainly respect that. Uh, Goblin, play the flume song. Our poor goblin. So thank you, a cleric, for coming here. I appreciate you joining me for now. And um, I will find you and I will end you. All right, everybody, please like, share, subscribe, check us out on Patreon, and have a good night. Bye-bye now. Bye. That was a good one. You've just been listening to Dumpstat, a podcast presented by Horizon Kingdoms. Horizon Kingdoms is a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition server that's free to play. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and join up on Discord to join in on a new adventure. For more Dumpstat, be sure to find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe. Oh my fucking god! Is that the finger of death cannon? (laughs) 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 This is so stupid.